and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, that we also may be glorified together. For I consider the sufferings of this present time not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. One of the ways that we often entertain ourselves when we get together with friends is to uh, square off and see who has the best story of a brush with fame, some celebrity that we've met, someone that we've known of greatness. My wife's story, I think, is fairly feeble, but her story is that when she was a little girl, uh, Lyndon Johnson, the President of the United States, stopped off in Guam, and there was a reception line to receive him, and she was on her dad's shoulder, and she remembers he was reaching up to grab her hand, and just before his hand, and just before her hand and his hand met, a security office spoke in his ear, and he turned away, and it uh, was snatched away, but she was that close to shaking hands, with the President of the United States. My story, I think, is a little bit better. Uh, you might remember back in the 70s that one of the lampoons they had on President Gerald Ford was that he fell all the time, he stumbled, that he was um, not good on his feet. Well, after he had ceased being the President, it was the time when Ronald Reagan was early in his presidency, or in the middle of his presidency, presidency I was going to seminary, and I was also a bellhop at the Marriott Hotel in Portland, Oregon. And Gerald Ford was coming to a, uh, come to a conference to speak to a number of people and be received in the ballroom at the hotel. And I was called upon to stand at the bottom of the stairs as a procession of people welcomed his, at him as he came in through the front doors. And he was coming in with all the secret uh, service agents, which, by the way, you can recognize who a secret service agent is. You know, they're all talking in the air like this, and they have glasses on him. So uh, as he was coming down the steps, he stumbled, and I caught him and steadied him. I caught the arm of Gerald Ford. <laughs> I saved his life. No. <laughs> so that's my boast. Anyhow, well, we can all talk about our brush with celebrities. Some of we could actually spend the whole time. We could have a, a, a testimonial here where you come up and you tell your stories, and we usually do it because we think at some point in time our association with that person of rather, rather of uh, you know significance yeah, adds stature or significance to ourselves because we had a, a brush with it. In this passage, God is revealing a connection that we have with the Lord Jesus that is astounding. If you're looking for prestige, and here's the first point, this is a title of tremendous prestige. Co-heirs with Jesus Christ. That means if God the Father had written out a will and testament and it was a legal document declaring what our inheritance would be, our names would be on the same line as the Lord Jesus himself. Heirs of the Father, co-heirs with Jesus Christ. How prestigious, how unimaginably privileged and prestigious and exalting that is. Take your Bibles and go to Ephesians chapter 2. And let me read to you verses 4 through 7. Here we read, following the, the opening verses of Ephesians chapter 2, the opening verses speak of the fact that we were by nature children of wrath and sons of disobedience. But then it says, But God, who is rich in mercy, because of His great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you've been saved, and raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us who are in or in Christ Jesus. Right now, our Lord Jesus is seated upon a throne of glory. He has been established as the heir of all creation. He is glorified as a result of the conquest of the great battle that he came and fought and won on earth. And he's ascended in victory to heaven. And he is surrounded by angels, holy angels who worship him and the saints who have gone before us. You want to read about it? Take your Bibles at some point in time. Read Revelation chapter 4, 
where they see him upon the throne and they cast their crowns before the throne and they fall before him and they worship and cry out, holy, 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 and worthy is the Lamb. And all the glory of this great place is being provided to Christ. He, he now abides in a place of tremendous exaltation. He resides in the highly exalted place at the side of the Father, surrounded with the honor and blessing and the of, the, of, the, of all that have gone before and all the angelic realm. He's in the highest place of prestige and privilege. But if you look there for a moment and imagine it, you, you should understand he's not sitting there alone. There's someone next to him, sitting right by him. Someone sitting with him. You know who it is? It's you. It's you. You have put your faith and put your faith and your, have repented of your sins and put your trust and your faith in Jesus Christ. You're seated next to him in that place of glory and prestige and honor and exaltation. You're there to receive with him all of that praise and all that glory, and it's stunning and it's wonderful and it's a privileged position. Every year, the President of the United States gives his State of the Union speech, and he uh, brings some citizen to the forum of the Senate, and the person sits in the balcony next to his wife. Maybe now they're adding it. There's more and more of these individuals and it's somewhere in the speech he plays some honor to that individual for something they've accomplished or something they've done. And at that moment, everybody that's there, all the senators and the judges and the representatives from the states turn around and look at the individual and they all clap for him. And it, it's a prestigious and wonderful moment. Yet it is nothing like the honor that is bestowed upon us who are seated with Christ in the heavenlies and designated as co-heirs with Jesus Christ. So there's the first point or the first idea. Co-heirs. It is a declaration of statement of exalted honor and privilege and prestige that is unimaginable. Here's another one. It is a guarantee of our inheritance in Jesus Christ. Our declaration that we are co-heirs or joint heirs with Jesus is a guarantee of our inheritance. We, we've spoke about this over the last while and prior to the messages that we've been speaking on, on the fact that we're heirs and co-heirs, we've been speaking about the fact that Satan is the accuser of the brethren, that he comes around and he tells us he has the book of the law underneath his arms, and whenever we stumble or we fail, he points out where we've failed and he brings the accusations of the law against us, and he seeks to drive a wedge between us and our hope of salvation or our hope of eternal life and to tell us that somehow that our salvation is tenuous and that our inheritance is tenuous, and that it all rests upon our shoulders and our ability to maintain our faithfulness. And when we come to Christ, there is this impulse or desire within us to live holy and godly lives, and we dig down deep into our own resources to try to accomplish it, and we fail, and we stumble, and we falter, and the enemy comes along and basically says, well, you can kiss that inheritance goodbye. Whatever you thought you had, you don't have it. You don't have it. You can say goodbye to it, and that's his job. He is the accuser of the brethren. That's what he does. And just for a moment, and just for a brief moment, let me, let me play the devil's advocate. Let me make his argument for him for a second. And you listen to it, because actually it's a rather compelling argument. He comes along and says something like this. You have to remember that Adam was created by God, and Adam was placed in a garden where God walked with him. And Adam was created, and God gave Adam a, a sinless and perfect heart and life. And Adam was able to stay in that garden, enjoying the presence of God, and all that God had made for him, and all that God, were, he had, he was in a place where he saw and experienced all the goodness of God. And he had all those privileges, privileges before him, and then Adam sinned, and he lost it all. He lost it all. And the angels the angels resided in the presence of God and they worshiped him and they were before the throne of God and they had immediate and direct access to God and all of his glory. They were in a place that you're hoping to go to one day. We were there. But then through rebellion and pride, a third of us sinned and we lost it and we were thrown out. What makes you think you're not going to lose it too? You claim the inheritance, but look what you've done and look what you do and look what you think and look how you live and look at the choices you've made. And if Adam could lose his inheritance and we could lose our inheritance, what makes you think that you won't lose your inheritance? So what's our answer to that? 
That's a pretty, a pretty compelling argument, I think. Well, our answer is something like this. I can't lose my inheritance because I'm a joint heir with Jesus Christ. My inheritance is not established in myself. It's established in Him. And I am in Him and He's in me. When you give your life to Christ and you confess your sins to Him and you believe and put your trust in Him, at that moment Christ comes and He, he lives by His Holy Spirit and He dwells within you. But not only that, the Bible says that we are baptized or we're immersed into Him. We're brought into Him. And I can't lose my inheritance because He can't lose His inheritance. He's claimed it. He stands in the presence and He's seated with me in heavenly places. I'm a co-heir with Christ. Look at Ephesians chapter 1. We read it in our scripture reading or at the very beginning, our call to worship. Ephesians 1, verses 11 and 12, speaking of ourself in Christ. And by the way, if you would read the first one and a half chapters of the book of Ephesians, at least 15 times the believer is identified as being in him, in Christ. That's our position of, that's our position of wealth and standing. Here it is. In him also we have obtained, obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. This is God's plan, that we should obtain this inheritance in Jesus Christ, that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. And the, the statement that secures our, that secures our inheritance is found in those first two words, in Him. It's the same idea here. We are joint heirs with the Lord Jesus because we've been placed into Christ and He has come into us. And Our identity is so interwoven with Christ's own identity that it cannot be suggested that the child of God will ever be separated from His inheritance. If He could, we'd have to conclude that Jesus Himself could be separated from his inheritance, and it won't happen. It also means this, that we will not receive this inheritance except by what way of the Lord Jesus Christ. Our inheritance comes to us because of what Christ has accomplished and what he has fulfilled perfectly in our behalf and then brought us into and made us claim. But it also means this, Christ will never claim his inheritance without us. We don't get it without him. He won't claim it without us. They're co-heirs with Jesus. What a wonderful assurance. What an answer to the enemy's accusations. Here's a third thing. As joint heirs, we have here an indication of the glory that will one day be ours with the Lord Jesus. Take your Bibles and go to Hebrews chapter 1. In verses 1 and 2, I just want to read you the introduction to this, this passage. It speaks of something of the glory that belongs to the Lord Jesus. It says there in verse 1 of Hebrews chapter 1, God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. Worlds. The Lord Jesus is the heir of all, not all things. He is the heir of all things, and you should understand all things to be all created things. All things that have been made come under Him and are received by Him as His inheritance, and He's claimed it all. All these things are what will one day be oriented to Him completely and brought under His feet as He reigns and He establishes His kingdom under all things. And so this is the majesty or the glory that belongs to the Lord Jesus. And, and now take your Bibles for a moment and go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And take this phrase, remember this phrase, Christ has been made the heir of all things. That's his appointment. That's what he's received. That's what he possesses. And then read this, which is a description of what has been given to the believer in Jesus Christ. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, let me read to you verses 21 through 23. Paul writes this, Therefore let no one boast in men. Don't boast about your brushes with presidents. It's not big enough. That's not a big enough boast. Therefore let no one boast in men. For all things 
are yours. Christ has been made the heir of all things. And this is, for all things are yours. Whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come, all things are yours. And you are Christ and Christ is God. This is God's. This is a, an expression of something of the glory that is awaiting us in our inheritance. We are not capable of imagining the glory that will one day be ours. And maybe it's not proper for us to think about those things, but maybe at least we could begin to allow our minds to imagine the glory that surrounds the Lord Jesus as we will gather before him and worship him. The glory that is his, the praise that is brought before him. Just uh, a few weeks ago, we considered John chapter 17, verse 24, and what it was that was the last request, in a sense, made on behalf of those who had put their faith and belief in him before he went to the cross and died for us. It's the very last thing he prayed for. And what he prayed for was that we would enter into the glory he was entering into. Here's what it says in John 17, 24. Jesus prays, Father, if you go to John chapter 17, there are a number of things that he prays for, for his redeemed people. And at the very end of making all these requests, here's his last request. Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which you have given me, for you have loved me from the foundation of the world. And so his prayer, his great longing, his crest is that we might be able to enter into and give expression to and enjoy the glory that is his. And yet in our passage, it says this. It says we're joint heirs with Christ. And at the end of it says that we also may be glorified together with him. Isn't that amazing? Christ is praying, I want them to see the glory that you're giving to me. I want them to be with me, my glory. And then it says that we may be glorified together with him as joint heirs with Christ. I don't know what that means entirely. But something of the wonder, the profound wonder that surrounds our Savior Jesus Christ, something of it of that, that comes to the throne of Jesus Christ, overflows to the thrones, our thrones that we'll inhabit with him in glory one day. It's profound. It's unimaginably glorious. And it is assured to the true child of God who's put their faith in Jesus Christ. Just as surely as it is assured to our Savior that all things will bring glory to His name, it is assured that we shall enjoy that glory with Him. We shall be glorified together with Him. I found this wonderful quote from John MacArthur, and here's what he writes. In the arithmetic of earth, if each heir receives an equal share of an inheritance, each gets only a certain fraction of the whole amount. But heaven is not under such limits, and every adopted child of God will receive the full inheritance with the Son. Everything that Christ receives by divine right, we will receive by divine grace. Undeserved, co-heirs with Christ. How wonderful, how glorious. And so John 17, 22, Jesus establishes our inheritance in his prayer by saying this, the glory which you gave me, I have given to them. How about that? Co-heirs with Christ, co-heirs even with the glory that will be ours in Christ. And if you read the New Testament, what you see is that the authors of the New Testament oftentimes forecast our views to that glorious moment and that day in which we will have all these things and receive all this from Christ. And they always then turn that promise to an incentive for holiness. The idea is if this is going to be ours, if we are going to shine and we're going to have put upon us the shine of the glory, even of our Savior Jesus Christ in that day and be exalted with Him, Live in that exaltation now. It's the exaltation of the moral glory of the Savior Jesus Christ. Having conquered sin now, say, Jesus, live in me your conquest. Put off those things that in any way detract from or make a statement to the world around us that is false and untrue to what is mine in you and what will be mine forever and ever. 
And so John says, whoever has this hope in himself, looking to the point in time when we'll see Christ and we'll be like him, for we'll see him as he is. John says, whoever has this hope in himself purifies himself, even as he's pure. It has a purifying influence on our life. It, it conducts within us an application that drives us to pursue and want to be holy, not because we're laboring to prove ourselves, not because we're laboring to hold on to inheritance, not because we're trying to show that we and ourselves are righteous, but because by faith we exalt in what is coming to us and what God has promised to us and what is ours through Jesus Christ. Because of what we will be and what we are and what we can claim even now in Him because we're seated with Christ in heavenly places. If you put your faith in them, that's where you are. If you, if you haven't, you're not there. But you can be. You can be secured in the promise of all the glory that is Christ and all the glory of eternal glory that are, will be His and is His now in heaven. Now, there is... A caveat here. We're not only heirs now of the glory of Christ, and we will claim it one day in fullness, but we're also joint heirs with Christ, and so we also inherit his sufferings. If we suffer with him, we shall also be glorified together. If we suffer, here's a phrase that says, if we suffer with him. Paul had suffered often in the service of Jesus Christ. He actually is writing. He's never been to Rome. He's writing to the Romans. He's anticipating coming to them. But when he does come to them, he doesn't know this, but when he arrives to them, he's going to arrive to them in chains. <laughs> he's going to arrive to them having had his life threatened and being under threat and being under judgment and suffering, more suffering as a head of Paul who has suffered much at this point in time already. And Paul probably knows it. He knows that suffering still is a part of our lot. He's been suffering as a professed believer in Jesus Christ, but Paul also knows this. Before he became a professed believer in Jesus Christ, he was one of the ones who brought suffering on other believers. He was a distributor of persecution and suffering to those who had turned to Christ. And again, we'll go back to Satan, the accuser. Satan comes along to us when we're suffering and when we're uh, in experiencing miseries and when we're experiencing deprivations. And when we're struggling and having hard times and those moments cast doubt upon us and he basically says, this really is your lot. You know, if, if you really believed in the God who is the God of all creation and the one who owns the cattle on a thousand hills, boy, is he sure a miser with you. <laughs> He's not giving you the good stuff you think you're getting and actually this is your lot. It's just more and more suffering and really, you know what you ought to do? Take a moment to grab as much pleasure as you can now because what you're hoping for is a dream. Read the experience of your life. And you know what it is? Suffering, trial, misery, dis a discouragement, hardship. And that's what you're facing. And that's what you're getting. And that's the testimony of pain in this life. And why should you believe that somehow it's going to get better? You know, the fact is, as we get older, it doesn't usually get better. We get weaker and we have challenges and struggles. And the Bible actually says... Man is born to trouble as sparks fly upward. I didn't quite understand that when I was 20. I understand that now that I'm a little older than that, as of yesterday. <clears throat> Life has its trials and its struggles and its difficulties. But for the believer, the suffering and the hardship and the difficulties turn for us. We don't engage them in the same way as the rest of the world. We are not somehow uh, descending away from our highest moments of pleasure and joy and privilege and descending into the miseries of, uh, of, and the hardships of an ongoing life. That's not how it is for us. For the believer, when we come to Christ, something transitions to. It's not our sufferings. It's His. And He shares them with us. And we enter into the sufferings of Christ. And we recognize that Christ is so identified with us in such a way that not only we do... Do we have pain and difficulty and hardship? And they increase, by the way, when you give your life to Christ. We experience some, we'll talk about this in just a moment, but we experience some unique sufferings that the world does not know. The Lord Jesus said to his own brothers when they uh, were uh, trying to tempt him to go up to Jerusalem when he knew that there were people there waiting to kill his life, he said, you can go to the world because you belong. You can go up there now because you belong to the world. This is your life. These are the things. This is your time for the world to pay its dividends to you, but... I'm not of the world. His lot and the dividends from the world he received was suffering and persecution and misery. And, but when 
Paul was going to bring suffering to the Christians in Damascus before he was converted, and the Lord Jesus met with him along the way, what did the Lord Jesus say to Saul? What were his first words? Saul, Saul, why persecuteth, in the old King James, thou me? Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He was going after the believers, but their suffering and their hardship had become Christ's own. And when he went to the cross, he bore our sin, but he also bore our sufferings. And so you know this, he never let them go. He never let go of our sufferings. They're his. They're his sufferings. Isaiah 63, 9 speaks of God's attitude towards his people, his covenant people, as they face sufferings. And there it says, in all their afflictions, he was afflicted. He was afflicted. I don't know how to solve all the issues of pain and sorrow and misery in the earth, but I do know this, that when we give our life to Christ and we believe in him, he takes our sufferings unto himself as his very own. He shares in our sorrows to such an extent in just the same way as certainly we may claim his glory, he has claimed our sorrows. And he doesn't identify them as ours. It doesn't say Jesus suffers with us. Our passage says, if we suffer with him, they become his first and foremost. And we bear them as his. And we suffer for his sake. And we suffer along with him, knowing that one day we will also be glorified with him. It changes things. Our suffering, Satan comes along and says, your suffering is evidence that you're really not a, a favored son of God. And God changes and says, no, our suffering is with the Lord Jesus Christ and it's a demonstration, a clear demonstration and it increases when we give our life to Christ. It's a clear demonstration that we are his heirs. He came to suffer with us. They became his own sufferings. Now we suffer with him and one day as co-heirs, we will be glorified with him. That's the promise. That's the wonderful promise. If we suffer with him, we shall be glorified with him. Amen. There are those, by the way, who will teach you that your suffering is because you lack faith in your life. They will say that as a Christian, if you believe in him, everything should go good. And if you're really having good faith in him, you should be seeing a life that is being enriched in every way. There are blessings that are being poured out upon your finances, blessings that are being poured out upon your home, blessings that are being poured upon your family, blessings that are being poured upon your life and health. And if you don't have those things, it's because you're not living and you're not exhibiting enough faith and that's not why you're not getting them. And there is a kernel of truth in that, but I would say that my great concern is not that you might not be a Christian because you don't have and you have not experienced an outpouring of blessing and abundance on your life. My concern is that you might not be a Christian if you have not and are not experienced experiencing suffering for the sake of Christ. If you're not enduring the various trials that come and when you suffer, when you encounter temptation and you endure it to the point of pain, the suffering you have when you seek to put to death the fleshly appetites that war against your own soul that are in your own life, the suffering that you undergo when you live in a world that is in opposition to our Savior, the sufferings that you have when you see the set of the minds around you are fixed against the good and gracious and perfect will of God, the suffering that you have because you're standing for Christ against the grain of a world that is living under the dictates and the sensitivities of live for yourself, gain your pleasure, here are the ways you can actualize yourself, Here's how you can achieve. Your heart and your mind is being drawn towards where do I go to surrender and give everything to Him and live for Him and for His glory. Ultimately, we live in a land, whatever we might say, where we still have religious freedoms. And there may be a rising prejudice against those who want to worship and trust in the Savior. And we see some hint of that, but oh, in other places, they don't see the hint of it. It is... Out, yeah, that's right. It is out wide in the open. And they're persecuted in ways that we can't imagine. Their properties are taken from them. Their homes are taken from them. They're put to death. And they suffer for Christ's sake. All who will live godly in this life, Paul said, will suffer tribulation. But it's not your suffering. It's his. It's his. And we suffer with him. Why does God let us suffer? Well, to purify our faith, 
to teach us patient endurance, to correct us and chastise us and conform us into the image of His Son, to wean us from this world and prepare us for our inheritance and glory. He allows us to suffer. He allows us to suffer so that as well we might know Him who was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. We might know Him in His profound condescension who was the God of all glory who came to suffer for our sakes so that we might share in our fellowship with Him in those things as we await and take stock in the glory that is waiting for us. As we do, in our sufferings, as we do, as we hope for the glory that's come, as we wean ourselves from the, the passing fancies of this world, we begin to gain a vision of the glory that come that in a sense morphs our sufferings into some small thing. That's what exactly happened to Paul. Paul says, for I reckon, I've added this up, I've suffered, and I've added this, I've reckoned that the suffering of this present time is not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. Co-heirs with Jesus Christ. Co-heirs with Jesus Christ. So, I would caution you to tabulate your Christian faith based upon its ability to deliver to you the conveniences of life. And I would caution you not to live out your Christian faith in an exercise of convenience. Here's an example. Don't just come to the house of God to worship. I, I'm sure you don't as a convenience. But when something else comes that would be a little bit more enjoyable, trade it out. The Bible says that as we see a day approaching all the more, we should not neglect the fellowship and the gathering together of ourselves in worship before the Lord. Don't let your life be an exercise, an example, that your faith goes to the point of convenience and no further. That's a dalliance with the world. That's how the world lives their lives as well. Uh, thank, frankly, their life is calculated around what would be the most convenient to my fulfillment. Our calculation is if we suffer with Him, co-heirs with Jesus, we'll be glorified with Him. We'll be glorified with Him. Let's bow our heads in this prayer. <clears throat> our Heavenly Father, we, your people, embrace our Savior, we cast ourselves at His feet. We claim Him as our Lord. We find in Him our sins washed and forgiven. We rejoice in that moment of release from the burden and guilt of our sins. We weep over His feet, and as we look at it, we see the, the nail print in His feet. We recognize and know He came and suffered for us. And He has not called us away from that commitment of service and suffering. And that measure of love he's called us into it we thank you dear jesus that when we do suffer when we do go through trials and difficulties and hardships not only do we go not go through it alone we don't go through it first we meet you lord jesus there you've tasted it for us you've drank the cup ahead of us You've called us to drink the cup with you. And you've said we will. We'll drink this cup with you. But, oh God, how rich and how glorious will be the day when the feast will be opened up before us in heaven and all the nations will gather before you and there at the table we will drink the cup in full and it will be a cup of glory. Co-heirs with Jesus Christ. Oh, God, may more individuals make sense of the perplexities of life in this unending hope and claim it through Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.